uh, as Dina was mentioned to you, there are different arms of the immune system, but particularly when we're interested in understanding how uh, a, a person can respond after natural infection or vaccination, uh, we tend to look at the adaptive immune response because it's the one that actually memory and can remember the encounter and actually can't react again once they encounter the virus again. And so uh, there are different main actors of the immune response. Uh, the most famous one perhaps is the antibody production exerted by the B cells. And so just to dig a little bit more in detail in what we mean with that, so antibodies are able to recognize the proteins that are on the surface of the virus. And so if the bound of these antibodies prevent the capability of the virus to infect the cells, then we call these to be neutralizing antibodies. But there are many antibodies that are actually not uh, able to exert that function and are still quite important because they're able to recognize the virus and then that is recognized by the innate immune response. So there are other effector mechanisms the antibody can exert in actually eliminating the virus. On the other hand, we have another type of that immune response, which are the T cell response. And so the T cells are very good in understanding whether a cell is infected and they are able to virtually recognize all the proteins of the virus. So their uh, capability to recognize is pretty broad and they accept multiple functions. So there are mainly and classically two types of T cells. One is the helper T cells. And so the helper T cells not only manage to recognize, but they also understand what is the best quality of response that the immune system should actually uh, mount against the infection. And so they have this beautiful uh, role of orchestrating uh, the response uh, of other components of the immune system. The CD8 T cells in cell, and the killer name actually uh, kind of give you some hint on that, they're able to recognize the infected cells and they actually kill it with specific uh, uh, function and releasing different molecules that actually uh, open the membrane of the cells, or they also produce different type of cytokine that are, are able to indeed recruit different immune population to actually eliminate the cells. And so uh, when we talk about specifically a vaccine uh, and also taking on the information I gave you before, definitely uh, the antibody response and particularly the neutralizing antibody response are the most important in actually protect against detectable infection. Uh, however, when we start looking on the capability to actually reduce this severity, the, the different components of the immune response are actually incredibly important. And in that also we have the T cells. And so there are several evidence in literature that actually point out on a substantial protective contribution of the T cells in actually limiting this in severity, either because their absence actually are associated with more severe disease or because when looking at samples longitudinally, we do see that an early kinetics of T cell response is actually associated with milder form of the disease of the infection. And additionally, also T cells have shown to be important also in the context of vaccination. And there are some animal models that actually show CD8 T cell response in particular are very important. And so all, there have been plenty of studies in the past two years to try to understand how the T cell response work but as we all know, in the meantime, the SARS-CoV-2 virus catch up and actually several variants has been exploded in the past uh, year or so. And so one of the questions was how much this variant affected the T-cell response. And so we were among the first one to try to understand this question in the early variants of concern. And we did so by looking both at natural infection and vaccination. So the results that we derived from our studies was indeed T cells that we still able to recognize the different variants. And that was an excellent news for vaccination. And so this study was also corroborating in other vaccine platform and in different geographical location in natural infection. And so overall, that was boding good news for the TSA response to be able to help us in limiting this severity, which is actually what we uh, saw in the context of vaccination. And indeed, many of these variants cause milder form of the disease after vaccination. And so one question that we wanted to try to address is, how much the virus is catching up on this. And so do we see a difference between early and late variant of concern? And particularly uh, looking not only at TISA response uh, in a vaccinated individual, and in the first study, we particularly look at mRNA-based vaccination, but we're also interested to understand whether we see a difference depending on the type of vaccines that you receive. 
And so we did that, and uh, um, the data that I'm going to show you today are expressed as full change. And so as you can see over here, anything that is around one uh, means that there is no change whatsoever. Everything that goes below this line means that there is a decrease and everything above an increase. And so we also add uh, some dotted lines to kind of give you an idea of the biological relevance of actually the fluctuation that you may observe. And so T cells, as I was telling you, they produce a lot of uh, factor function and cytokine, but there are some type of uh, T cells, particularly the CD4 T cells, that just their activation and the crosstalk with different cells can exert a function. And so to try to detect both, we use a combined assay that detect activation of the T cells and also cytokine production. And so if we look at the activation of the T cells uh, and we compare it with the different variants, it appears quite evident that there is no fluctuation. We do not see a significant decrease in the later variants versus the early. And so that is an excellent news, basically suggesting that the CD4 T cells are still able to recognize the different variants. If we look in terms of the functionality, and so here we look at multiple cytokines, and uh, previous studies have shown that not only interferon gamma is important in fighting SARS-CoV-2 infection, but also other cytokines such as TNF-alpha and IL-2 are very, very important. So we decide to look at a larger panel of cytokines all at once together. And when we do that, once again, in terms of functionality, we see no difference, nor we do see difference in terms of polyfunctionality. So as we know, T cells, uh, when they produce multiple cytokines, they actually exert a better function and response. And this has been particularly shown in the context of vaccination for other infection. And so here we notice that also the polyfunctionality of T cells are not affected at all between the original ancestral and the other variants. And the same picture was true even when we look at the CD8 T cell response. And so all of the data that I'm showing you is combining the different type of vaccine platform. But even when we break the different vaccine platform, the message didn't change. You still have a quite conserved uh, response that is able to recognize the different variants. And so all of this that I show you up to now is very close to vaccination. So the next question we wanted to try to address is what happened if we start looking at time points that are more uh, later in vaccination. So for this time point that uh, we decided to focus on, which was three to four months post vaccination, we also wanted to have a more in-depth look at the different adaptive memory response as indeed all of them are important in uh, mounting an efficient response able to clear the virus. And so for this specific uh, part of the time point, we also focus on the major variant of concern, and that also allowed us to broaden the type of vaccine that we look at it, including also the Novavax vaccination, which is uh, protein based. And so here we were having really three of the uh, main type of vaccine platform that are currently used uh, for uh, SARS-CoV-2. And so if we look at the B cell response, whether we look at the memory B cells, the neutralizing antibody or the titers, the message doesn't really change. We do see indeed a significant decrease uh, on the different variants. And particularly we did see a major decrease in the context of the beta. And that was consistent with previous literature. Then instead, when we look at the T cells, that's not what we see. And in reality, the majority of the response in terms of activation is actually preserved. We do start, though, uh, seeing a little bit of significant decreases, particularly in the context of the Delta variant, and in general, a wider spread of the response, suggesting that although at the general population level, you do still have a good recognition, there may be some individuals that actually can be more affected the, the longer the time passes from vaccination. And so uh, we also look in this case also to a subpopulation of the CD4, the TFH, that are incredibly important in their capability to cross talk with the B cell memory response to produce antibody. And uh, indeed, there was no difference in here. So uh, that was also important to show that there was not a lack of T cell uh, help uh, in causing the decrease that we observe at the B cell uh, part. And so Everything that I show you up to now is looking at T cell response against the entire spike protein. And we designed this exactly because we want to have a general idea of how the different individuals uh, recognize the response. But in reality, and I'm just going to uh, quickly go back to general immunology, the way T cells are able to recognize an infected cells is actually by chopping the virus and have some of these fragments recognized by the HLA molecules. 
So the HLA molecules are one of the most variable uh, gene in, uh, in, uh, in the human genome, but not only. And so there are so many alleles uh, that are available, and depending on the geographical population, there are some alleles that are more frequent and others less. And so it was very important for us to understand whether we don't see a response or a difference in response, but maybe there are some variants that actually affect parterism epitopes or parterism HLAs frequent in specific population. And so uh, for this part of the studies, what we did was a bioinformatic approach. And basically uh, we were leveraging the knowledge that uh, the different scientists, including ourselves in the past two years, have been devoted in trying to understand what epitopes are recognized by the T cell response. And so we did that uh, thanks to the IDB database that actually collect all this experimental information. And what we decided to do was to get the epitope list and kind of lumping up with the list of amino acid mutations pertaining to the different variants to see indeed how much of these epitopes were impacted. And so um, in this case, uh, the approach that we taken was not only spike bias, but looking at the entire SARS-CoV-2 protein, because the entire SARS-CoV-2 protein can be virtually recognized in a natural infection. And so if we look at the entire protein to begin with, uh, we were unable to see a significant difference between early and late variants. And in general, the majority of response is quite conserved. And while we do see a drop uh, in, uh, in conservancy in the context of the Omicron variant, definitely um, that is still uh, account for 88% of more of the response, whether you look at CD4 or C8. Even when we just narrow down this analysis and look only at the spike protein, and that is the more relevant for vaccination because the spike is the only antigen that is being given. We do still have a pretty high conserved response, and uh, the decrease in Omicron is still observed, but still 72% or more of the response is actually there. The other point that I didn't mention is uh, how many mutations are actually impacting the capability of the HLA molecules to recognize the T-cell response. And that was relevant because, as you can see, the majority of the mutations are actually single mutations, so one amino acid in the entire epitope. So we decided to look also at that, and uh, we were happy to see that in reality, when you have a single point mutation in the majority of the case, 70% or more, the epitope can still be uh, presented to the immune response and virtually could be recognized by the T cell response. So all the data that I showed you in the previous slides were really conservative estimates and virtually in reality, uh, the capability of T cells to recognize might be even higher than that. There is another point to take into account is the fact that not every epitope has the same value. And so there are some portion of uh, particular the spike proteins that are more frequently recognized by different individuals, maybe because they share uh, similar HLA molecules. And so here I'm giving you an example, just pointing out what is the pattern of recognition of CD4 and CD8 and combining that with the different mutation of Omicron. As many of you may know, Omicron is actually the variant with the highest number of mutation in the spike protein, over, over 30 overall. And so we were interested to understand. And you can already uh, look and see that many of these mutations don't necessarily fall in regions that are really dominant. And so we decided to do our analysis again and try to now break uh, our data in uh, regions that are more dominant and more subdominant. And so when we did that, uh, it was even uh, better news because what we found is in the majority of the case, the dominant epitopes were less affected by the mutation of the variants that is particularly true for Domicron than the subdominant ones. We did see an inverted trend in the context of the beta variant, but that was still the case in the context of Delta. And it was true whether we look at CD4 or CD8 response. So overall, the conclusion of uh, the different bioinformatic analysis is that also uh, if we look at the different variants, even Omicron and the mu variant that at the time actually were uh, circulating, uh, we should still have a, a quite conservative response. Is that so? And so of course, we were really interested in understanding what happened at the experimental level. And so we decided to actually look at that as six months post vaccination and different vaccine platform. And uh, the rationale also was the fact that at the time of the study, the majority of the people were actually at the five, six months post vaccination and not yet were having available a third boost uh, vaccination dose. And so 
if we look at the B cell, unfortunately, we were seeing quite the significant decrease in terms of capability of the B cell response to recognize Omicron variant. But the T cell response instead, uh, we're still able to recognize the different variants, even Omicron, at six months post vaccination. So that was uh, quite uh, surprising, and we were quite happy to see that that was the case, particularly in the context of spike, that uh, for Omicron was having so many mutations. And so the final question we were having is like, okay, but what is the molecular mechanism behind the capability of T cells to be able to recognize the different variants? And so uh, specifically in this court, we select some candidates where we narrow down until the epitope level. And have in mind this type of experiments are quite consuming in terms of cells. Uh, we need over 400 ml of uh, blood to actually be able to answer this question. And so we did that, and uh, then we look uh, specifically at the individual repertoire and try to see how many of the individual epitope recognized are actually having mutation in one of the variants. And so here I'm going to show you just the CD80 cell epitope repertoire. So definitely the amount of epitopes recognized and the type of sequence really depends on the different alleles. And as you can see, you can have donor like the one over here that recognizes a, a narrower repertoire, or donor like this one that recognizes a larger repertoire, with a median of 10 to 11 epitopes recognized for the CD8 and CD40 cell response. Then the other point is uh, how many of these epitopes are really affected by the variants. And that is changing as well. So uh, not necessarily the stronger epitopes is the one that is affected by the mutation, and that is true both in this case and also in this case. In some cases, you can have very good, uh, high recognized epitopes that actually are affected the mutation. And so this is kind of provide the molecular basis on why some individuals show some decrease in the capability to recognize Omicron, although the general population doesn't. And so if we want to look at the same uh, data from a variant point of view, uh, whether we look uh, at one of these three, on average, 80% of more of these responses is conserved. And so that overall suggests that, yes, we do see a little bit of decrease at the individual level. The majority of individual at the population level can still recognize Omicron. And so this is a little bit the recap of the entire study. And just to summarize, we look at the SARS-CoV-2 variants and trying to understand how T cells recognize it. We took a bioinformatic approach that was the most comprehensive and also allowed us to predict the effect of people that got natural infection and not vaccination. And at the experimental level, we look at different type of vaccine platform and different time points. No matter how you look at it, T cells are still there and are still able to recognize the different variants. And um, that was an important point that was actually highlighted also um, by Dr. Fauci in one of his uh, Congress hearing. Uh, just to conclude, uh, in our lab, we have also been interested in trying to uh, establish worldwide collaboration. And that is because we look specifically at antigen-specific T cells. And so it's important to have a reagent that is available and uh, can be used also to standardize a little bit the, the results that the different labs uh, obtain. And so we have been established in the past two years, many collaborations, one actually also with the University of Columbia. And particularly in the context of the variants, we were interested in broadening our collaboration in different geographical locations. And so many studies came out of this, but I would like to highlight uh, the, the most recent one of Omicron. And that was uh, a fantastic effort because in the spanning of two to three weeks, the five independent papers, our self comprised, were actually reaching the same conclusion that T cells are able to cross recognize, therefore, instructing each other findings. And they look at different um, flavor of the T cell immune response, whether they look at immunocompromising individuals, a different wave of natural infection, or even different vaccine platform. So that was very powerful in, in actually concluding the importance of T cells in actually recognizing the Omicron variant. And so with that one, I would like to conclude to thank the fantastic team I have the pleasure to coordinate, particularly for these studies, which was a joint effort of the lab of Professor Sette that I'm part of and Professor Crowley. And so I would really like to uh, spend this last minute just to thank them all for the fantastic job they've been doing. And thank you very much for the attention. Happy to take any other questions. Uh, all right. So. So thank you very much for that beautiful story. That it's in many ways, I think, comforting, I guess, 
data to think that the T cell responses are broad and long lasting and, uh, you know, uh, a, a better story than the antibody stories that we've been hearing generally. So this is, this is good news. I, I had one question. I didn't understand what HLA most of the T cell work was done with. It, was it a, a, a common HLA in those experiments? And, and then, uh, then the second question is, are there individual HLAs that blow holes in the response that fail you know, with a given uh, epitope? Thank you. Uh, yes, indeed, it was more confirming than what we saw in the antibody. And once again, we should remember that T cells are unable to protect us from the infection. So uh, it's always good to have uh, all the component of the immune system working for us. Uh, in terms of the way we carry out this experiment, so from the experimental point of view, we wanted to be broad. And so what we did was to design overlapping 15-mer by 10 amino acids spanning the entire spike protein. And then for each different variant, we actually used the action mutation. And so what you were having was the broader recognition. And so that allowed us to basically not factorize the HLA factor when we performed the experiments. In the case of the BAM formatic analysis, that of course we need to rely on what has been available in IDB. And uh, in our previous studies, we actually tried to look at epitopes uh, and we really made an effort to look at different HLA molecules that were frequent worldwide. And so I haven't shown you the data, but even if you look at the data, just looking at our single data set, the message doesn't change, which suggests that uh, probably not necessarily there are specific alleles that are associated with the uh, severe form of the disease. This is, however, very interesting um, point that we would like to look at it. And to do that, you need uh, tons of data, actually, not only in terms of the HLA typing, but also understanding how the people uh, respond to the vaccination or the disease severity. So that is one of the things we're trying to look into that right now. So, so I guess there might be individuals out there with a bad HLA that don't deal well with a given peptide, but they probably are not going to deal badly with all peptides, so they'll, they'll still have adequate response somewhere. Yes, that would be the case. And let's also remind that it's a teamwork the immune system. So maybe even if you have uh, an epidus that is uh, lowering down CD4 or CD8 is a response, you still have the other subpopulation and you have also the rest of the immune response to help you out. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, Eric had a question maybe? Yes. Uh, hi, Alba, great talk. Um, I feel like my question is almost the same one that I asked Dina, uh, but I'm curious whether um, any of the individuals in your study had either experienced natural infection or whether um, you have looked at individuals that are unvaccinated but had been infected. Yes, so um, this specific study, we wanted to rule out the natural infections. So the majority of the vaccinees, we actually exclude anyone that was positive for nucleocapsid serology. Uh, but to answer your question, we look at natural infection, we look at unexposed uh, in, in our previous study. So that was not in the context of Omicron, but we look at the alpha, beta, uh, gamma uh, variants. And so what we found is that the picture does not really change even if you look at nat infection. The capability to cross-recognize the different variants is still there, not only for the spike protein, but also for the other proteins. And so we should just remind the T cells in, in reality, they recognize eight to nine um, antigen of SARS-CoV-2 with a response that account for 80%. Spike is barely 25% of the entire T cell responses. And so when we look in depth also to the mutation in the, the other proteins, the message doesn't change. And so that was good news. Um, in terms of the unexposed, um, that's something that we didn't look for the variants, but we actually look in our original cell paper uh, where we actually saw that 50% of unexposed individuals were having a pre-existing immunity against SARS-CoV-2. And that was input to be cross-reactivity with common cold coronaviruses. And uh, recently, in another study, we show that actually people that have this pre-exposed activity do uh, behave better upon vaccination. So therefore, suggesting that the minimal cross-reactivity you see at the T cell response can actually give you a kickstart also in uh, responding against SARS-CoV-2. Thank you. 
Sure. So, so we have one question from uh, Ezra Susser who asks, uh, is this also true for older people or we don't know yet? And I'm not sure what the this is. As well. <laughs> or maybe the I, whole think, uh, I think I understand. So it is true that uh, the age is a factor in disease severity for natural infection. And so um, the vaccination court that we look at it were broader in terms of age uh, and they were ranging uh, quite high. And so in, in our study, maybe we we're not powered to actually see an effect, but we also didn't observe in our data set an effect on, on age and the capability to cross recognize. The point that we need to remember is that depending on the type of vaccination we receive, uh, our response can be more or less long lasting. We know that there is a little bit of warning immunity throughout the time. And so the real question is not much um, if I recognize the variants, the real question is, uh, am I going to be one of those people that actually have this immunity winding down and requires an additional booster dose or not? What we see is that once you have the TISA response, the, they recognize the different variants. So that's good news. Uh, at the end of the day, it's just important to add the immune response there.